There's a lot of architecture in our garden. We like to build simple structures for a number of reasons. Tall crops can grow up them, and we can get three times the yield in the same space. Or crops that like a little extra heat can be protected. We build structures for the flower garden, too, to display plants and help them grow better. I like to stick to the really simple ones that I can build myself with a minimum of carpentry skills. I'm Elliot Coleman. And I'm Barbara Damrosh. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll show you how to build simple structures in your garden. On Gardening Naturally. trellis is really my favorite garden structure because it's so simple and so clean. Simple, upright, and clean. There's no waste to it. The uprights are two by twos, cut at the lumber yard out of a two by four, probably the least expensive wood you can buy. A hole in the top of here, a hole in here, and a 20 penny nail to keep this sitting on top. I could have used a wire, but it sags. I prefer a solid crossbar. Now this is a short one for a short crop of peas. I can also make tall ones for whatever else I want to grow. And for that, I'd probably use an eight foot two by two cut from an eight foot two by four. Since people worry about wood rotting in the soil, I coated this with a wood preservative. Not a bad one, probably the only eco wood preservative I know of. It comes from a company called Eco Design in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And the active ingredients are a birch bark extract and orange oil. Now to put the post in the ground, and have it six and a half feet above ground, I've measured a line at 18 so the rest of it will go in the soil. I make a good hole with an iron bar to make life easier for myself, and then insert the post to the proper depth. If it doesn't go in far enough, the best thing to tap it with is a dead blow mallet. Then I want to form the top. Check the line to see that it's in there, and fill in the soil. The next step, before I put the crossbar on, is to put the netting on. And that's a two-person job. So I'm gonna go find Barbara to help me. Well, I've got the net all spread out for us, Elliot. That's great. This is a very strong nylon net and it's wonderful for climbing crops. And the trick is to put it on the posts so you have the horizontals on alternate sides of the post. I just take my hand and I sew it right up through here, alternating top, bottom, top, bottom. And then this allows me to have the netting all lined up to go right over the post. You ready? Here we go. Then we just reach up to the top and drop that nice little piece right over the top of the post. And then we can pull the netting right down and it's tight and in place. The final step is to put on the crossbar. And that's done the same way as we put the netting over the uprights. I'm just gonna sew this through, left, right, left, right as we go along here. Sometimes it may snag, and that's why it's useful to have a second person helping you do this. Also to hold the thing up. Also to hold the other end of it up, that's right. Okay, when I get to the end, I just put it up on top, take one of those 20 penny nails, Find the hole, and everything's together. And the same at the other end. Now, often you can't buy mesh tall enough for a tall structure like this. I couldn't. So I just took two pieces and tied them together, turned two short ones into a tall one. And what grows up this wonderful structure? Well, peas, obviously. Climbing beans will do very well. But we also grow cucumbers and train their vines through here. So the Cucumbers hang long and straight. We train tomatoes up here. And there's even a climbing zucchini. Boy, does that like this structure. The next structure we're going to show you how to build is the out-of-season special, the cold frame. But for that, we have to go back to the house where I can plug in my saw. You ready? Yeah, let's go. All right. talk about zucchini, their question always is, how do you keep it under control? 
You turn your back, and suddenly you have a monster like this. Well, I'm going to give you an answer that's really sort of funny. The way you're going to keep it under control is to grow an even more vigorous zucchini. Now, this is a vining zucchini called zucchini rampicante, rampant, and look at the rampant growth of the vines, or also called zucchini tromboncino, trombone-shaped, because these fruits widen out at the end. It's very vigorous. You're going to keep it under control by training it up this trellis, and you want a good, strong trellis, and by pruning out the extra growth so you favor just fruit production. Let me show you how that works. Now, shoots come out of this plant at every node, and each one of those is going to be a long vine unless you cut it off. Once it has a fruit, this is the leaf. You can leave that, but this is the growing tip, and you just want to nip that out with your fingers, and then you're going to have fruits, fruits, fruits right on up to the top. Now, are they delicious? You bet they are. And they're easier to find because they're hanging here off the ground, not hidden under leaves somewhere. You can cut them at this size or let them get half again as big. They're still delicious. But the best thing is their flesh. It is much solider than regular zucchini flesh, and you can put it in almost any sort of dish without it falling apart. A real bonus. We've got everything laid out here that we need to build a cold frame in order to show you how simple it is, because basically a cold frame is nothing but a large box that sits on the ground, no top, no bottom. We build ours out of two inch stock, a two by 12 for one edge, two by eight for the other, and a piece of two by 12 that I sawed on an angle so it fits from one side to the other. We put it together with drywall screws. We find they're the easiest and best. You can just use a battery-powered driver like this. And it's about as quick a way to put things together as anybody could want. And solid, too. The other nice thing about drywall screws is if you make a mistake, you can reverse the driver and undo it. We've set the corners on pieces of wood so we can keep it flat because we want to make sure that we have a nice flat side on the bottom of this frame. I'm putting three screws in each of the eight inch corners. I'm gonna put four screws in the 12 inch corners. In my experience, that makes it just about as strong as it needs to be. If there's a slight bow to the wood, as you can see here, it's fine. One nice thing about the drywall screws is they'll pull all that right in together. And we will line up all these corners, as I said, carefully, making sure they're as square as possible. We'll line that one up at the, yeah, top, the top first. first yeah. And then you can push out that bottom edge. Mm -hmm. Wait a sec. <laughs> or the other thing we can do is just push it with my hand, too. Yeah, that's good. Got you it. got it. There, that does it. Oh. Now, we've built this box upside down, and for a very good reason. This bottom edge, and this is the angle edge I cut on this piece in order to make it match from 12 to 8, I cut it with a skill saw. It isn't perfect, but it doesn't need to be because it's actually going to be on the downside. Now, the one thing everybody wonders about is, isn't this going to rot because it's in contact with that fertile soil and all those nice soil bacteria that make everything rot in the soil? Yes, it will, and I don't want to use wood preservative on it with the atmosphere in here of my vegetables in order to protect it. So I use another simple trick what I call a sacrificial strip. We just take a piece of waste, two by two, and put it on top here. Remember, top is the bottom, and attach it. These strips are what will be in contact with the fertile soil, and so after four or five years, they do rot out. I just take them off, put new ones on, and the rest of this, which is held in the air by them, is protected. I'll show you in just a bit. Ah! 
I'm not using long screws because they're not supporting any weight. They're just holding these strips on for a few years. And at that point, we're almost finished. And we can flip it over and put it in the position that it will be when it's used in the garden. And by doing that, we now have a nice flat surface on top for the lights to sit on. The lights are the frames with glass that let the sun in. And you then have a nice, neat fit between them. Also, frame a slight slope to the south lets a little more sun in. But there's one more part. There are two notches, and they're there for a reason. We're going to put one more piece across here, a brace, to hold the front side and the back side apart, and so they won't warp. And I'm going to put it in with drywall screws, just like I did the other pieces. But it has one extra very important use. I may have to someday to move this frame by myself. And this is quite a big and heavy piece of equipment. But now I have a suitcase handle. And if I ever need to move this by myself, I can just step into the center and lift it up and move it anywhere I want to around the garden. Now all we have to do is set the lights on top of the frame. All right, I'll get one. The term light is used for the glass that goes on top of a cold frame. This is just one light. The reason my cold frame is the size it is, is that is the size that can be covered by four lights. Now this is a design I saw in Holland. I loved it when I saw it, it was so simple. These are two by twos, and there's just a saw kerf cut in there that this piece of glass has been slid into. A one by two on the end and a little wooden stop. The stop is there so the glass doesn't fall out, but there's nothing to block any rain that falls from running right off. Keeps this from rotting out and makes it a really nice structure. Now, I have glass in mind, but you can put in many other materials. For example, this structured sheet made out of plastic. It has two layers and little ridges in between to hold them apart. And you'd use a large sheet of it the same way you would glass. Slide it in to the saw kerf. You might want to make the saw kerf a little wider because this is thicker than glass and the sheet would sit held under the stop there. Water would run off the same way. But either way, whatever you use, glass or plastic structured sheet, a cold frame box provides ideal winter growing conditions for any plants you want to grow. Every gardener has some favorites that they love just because they're so dependable. And this is a good example. This is called liatris or liatris. The plants don't care how you pronounce their Latin names. It has several common names too, gay feather or blazing star. This is a Native American meadow plant and it's just great. It has sturdy stems that never seem to flop over, forms a nice tidy clump that just increases in size slowly over the years and the pollinators love it. Hi there bee. Now, most liatris comes in this lovely pale purple color. It isn't a magenta purple, it's just a nice soft color that blends well in the garden. It has this nice fat spike, it's a great cut flower. It opens from the top here, and then the buds gradually open and it becomes fuzzy all the way down. There are several other kinds you can find too. There's a compact cultivar called Kobold, which is good if you have a, sh a small garden <clears throat> or want a shorter plant for the front of the garden. There's also a white variety that I sometimes grow. Liatris is great to grow if you want a tall vertical accent to combine with bushier plants, like this purple bee balm, or the purple coneflower back here, and this white nicotiana. I think it makes a very pleasant picture having them all together. I wanted a simple, natural-looking, rustic fence for the edge of this garden, partly for my roses to climb on, and partly to define the area on the other side turn it into a little garden room. So Elliot and I cut some cedar logs out in the woods, peeled them, which is very easy to do, cut a mortise, and set some rails in. Now you may not have a source of woodland where you can cut cedar, but most garden centers and lumber yards have some kind of posts and rail systems in a rot-resistant wood that you can go buy instead. Now over here, we're doing a variation on the same theme. Here we're leaving the bark on the posts now, it's not going to last forever. Over the next year or several years, it'll gradually peel off of its own accord. Eventually, both this and this will weather to a nice gray color. How's it coming? It's great. I got the last hole made about to sharpen the final post. Great. It's always fun to do the same thing in a different way. So in this case, instead of cutting a mortise, 
we use two smaller poles side by side. We put spacers in between them, and it gives us a very nice place to set the rails. I'll sharpen that last pole. Fine. I'm not as comfortable with an ax as Elliot is, so when I do this, instead of sharpening the post and driving it into the hole, I dig the hole a little deeper so the post just rests at the bottom of the hole. That works just as well. What's well that? When you drive something like this, rather than driving it with a sledgehammer, it's best to drive it what's called a dead blow mallet. And then you won't deform the end of it so much. Also, this is designed so it doesn't bounce off when it hits a hard object. Now I'm going to hit this really hard to try and get it down in there to the right depth. If I couldn't, well, it wouldn't hurt a little bit to take a saw and cut some off. There, that came out pretty even. The next step is to put in the spacers. We've marked on the side here where we want them to go, and we're just going to set it there. I'm going to take my electric drill, make a hole in here for a nail, and then we're all set to go. Why don't you drive that nail in, Barbara? Done. We find it works best if we put a nail in on both sides. Yeah. Great tools. And then all you have to do is put a rail on top, and you have a nice rustic oh, fence. Oh, isn't that nice? Now, if we wanted to extend another section of this fence, we would just lay the next rail like that. And we'll put the second one down there. There. Let's put the last rail in. And we have our fence. And it looks pretty darn nice. Elliot and I recently put an addition onto our house, and we thought it would be lovely to have some climbing vines up the front, so we designed a lightweight trellis for them to grow on. But we had two concerns in mind when we planned the trellis. First of all, we weren't sure whether or not we might want to paint this house later, and we thought the vines might get in the way. So what we did was we hinged the trellis down here on some posts that hold it away from the house so that this can all be folded down flat if we choose to paint. The other thing we were worried about is whether having vines flat against a house might cause moisture to build up and cause the shingles to rot in time. So we've got hooks at the top, six inches long, that hold it rigid away from the house and let plenty of air circulate around the shingles. The structure of the trellis we made out of two by twos. That's a two by four cut in half. And I made mortises in them. And so it's all done with lap joints, very simple and reasonably easy to do. And that gave us the main frame where it goes around the window and provides the outside structure. The rest of the trellis, you can buy trellis strips at your local hardware store, lumber yard, which is what we did here. And then we have woven them through here Alternate weaving. Weaving gives it more strength. It also looks prettier, too, I think, Barbara. Yeah, much prettier. This, you can also do this while it's lying flat on the ground. Okay. And then we just nail them in place. Like that. There, now you're ready to plant. I gave a lot of thought to what to plant here, and I decided on clematis. There's several good reasons why. First of all, we have dappled sunlight on this trellis, not full sun. If I planted roses, I think they'd want full sun, but clematis will do fine in the, in the part shade. The other thing is that it's a, it's a soft, light plant that isn't going to require a great big head, such as I'd have to build with wisteria or trumpet vine. The other thing is the stem is flexible, so that if I weave it through here like this, we're going to be able to fold the trellis right down again without harming the plant. Let's try it, Elliot. All right. Okay. I'll go up and unhook this hook if you can come hold this edge. Sure enough. Okay. There we go. There it goes. There. Now, as you can see, this gives us full access to the house. Let's put it back up. 
And let's see how the clematis did. Well, it made it through that exercise just fine. It looks great. Let's plant it for real. Okay. You don't have to be a master carpenter to create some useful structures for your garden. These things are simple to do, they're fun, and they're practical. The garden trellis supports your climbing crops. The cold frame provides a home for out-of-season crops. Garden fences divide and delineate garden spaces, and the hinge trellis lets you grow vines up the house and yet maintain the house at the same time. And best yet, we've made a lot of these out of materials that are either free, inexpensive, or easy at hand, and that saves a lot of money. It sure does. And the nicest thing about coming up with your own solutions is that the garden has your own particular look to it, and the structures that you make fit in with that. And these give you a little project to work on, maybe early in the spring or late in the fall, when you're waiting for the garden to grow or after it's finished. And so for now, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, doing something for your home can be easy, even fun. Check and see here on Home Bodies. Then, add value to your home with some serious improvements. The Home Pro shows you how. Mm -hmm.